Sorry to say, it's too late for you guys. <laughs> but this is what is happening, not only in Thailand. I'm not inventing this new, but it happened in China, happened of course in Singapore. Training courses for the kids to do this kind of uh, commercial exercise are being done almost every day. It's not in the school, but mostly by commercial enterprises. And this is where we actually have decided that maybe this is probably the right path to emphasize. The private sector themselves has to assume its very responsibility of moving the country forward, in particularly to address this issue of globalization and liberalization, economic liberalization. Nobody else can do that because it is the private sector that understands the market. It is the private sector that has a new one, knows the trick of the trade. So we invite them actually to participate directly. They have, you heard of this CSR, right? Corporate Social Responsibility. And you heard projects that are uh, done by the bank, for example. I love the bank because they're easy to attack. The bank loves to build school for kids. And to them, this is CSR, right? My question is, are the bankers trained as a constructor? The answer is no. Are they trained as a mason? No. But what are they good at? They're good at finance. They're good at financial management. So what should they do then? They should train these people in the rural areas on finance. And of all the areas, of all the areas, you even look at yourself right now, of all the areas, of skill that you need to survive in the present day. You know, this modernization day, going to the bank and put your money in there, use the ATM, pull out the money, and balance your checkbook and so forth. Have you, have you, get yourself trained in doing that until you are actually graduate and start to work? Isn't that a basic skill that we, everybody, should have? Since you are 10, not when you are 25 and get a job, right? Now, I think these are the basic skills that are very much lacking in Thailand and, of course, particularly in the rural areas. And we need to train these people. And if they are well equipped with this knowledge, this know-how, I think they will be able to manage it a little bit, uh, their life a little bit better and they'll be more ready to handle the age of the challenge of globalization. What happened in, well, there are some studies that um, I did when I was at uh, Thailand Urban Research Institute some 10 years ago, 10, sorry, 20 years ago. Lost count of my, of my age. Um, we look at the rural community, and this is what we found, that uh, we look at what we call the the road to poverty. How do people become poor in the rural areas? This is what we found. First of all, most of the time, uh, people in the rural areas are very lucky because we have some land. We, through inheritance, we have some land. Most of people have land. But as economic develop, the first thing that happened in the rural areas the price of land go up, right? The price of land go up. Before you know the price of land go up, the speculator know that the price of land will go up. So they come around and they buy land. They offer, the market price is uh, say uh, 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 10,000 bucks a right. They will offer 20,000 bucks a right. And if you're a farmer, you say, wow, you know, that's double the market price of what you do to sell the land. And in no time, and you then have a huge amount of money with you, right? You have 20 right, uh, you may have uh, 200,000. If you have 200,000 back, the first thing you do is to buy a motorcycle. If you have 2 million back, you have 100 right, you sell the land. If you have 2 million back, the first thing you do 
is by a bigger drug. Right? So that's what happened. What is left from that study? Your relative know that you have sold the land, you come, hey, you sold the land, now you're rich. Can I borrow some money? In no time, you become a poor person with a motorcycle, which you don't have the money even to fill the gas. So you do Next thing you do, you sell your motorcycle, and you become a perfect, landless, poor person. That's the road to poverty in Thailand. What happened? These people, they never thought of financial management. If they were thought about financial management, save some of the money for education for the kid. Save some of the money to invest in some crops, some business, or buy some more land. They would then have a different way of thinking, a different way to manage themselves. Then you're going to have a much more strong community as a base for development. Now, in the developed countries, this is not very much the case because they were taught how to do this. But we, you know, in the developing countries, we were not taught how to do this simple financial management for our life. And I think that is very, very sad. Anyway, that's uh, probably what I'm talking about. And of course, at the Thai Trade Representative, we, we bring the, we, we help the government in shaping some of these policy strategy and uh, uh, both moving forward uh, and implementation of the uh, uh, trade negotiation. One of the things that we do, and um, in fact, a colleague from uh, Poland just came up to me and said, I have some trade issues. And we do have actually um, uh, monthly meeting with the Joint Foreign Chamber of Commerce and for them to bring the issue to us because they actually have many channels themselves but we open the channel so that we can hear from the business themselves what are their problems but we do not want to hear from individuals mm. if we do that then we run the risk of being biased so they will say that uh, Sutat is taking some money under the table for having this company or that company so we, we, we deal with the association so you bring the issue to us as an association so we deal with it so every, we, uh, every month we, we, we have a meeting and uh, we have resolved some of the issues of the business people in Thailand. The visa issues, immigration issues, tax issues for the investor who already are here and have problems. Tax issue, of course, uh, has been on our agenda for quite some time and uh, we resolve issue one by one. So that is what we do also as the Thai Trek representative. So we do strategy, we do implementation. We take mission now abroad. My, my, my purview is in, in ASEAN countries, but I uh, also look at Africa. But I also look at, I help my boss to look at the construction industry, food industry. So we, in, in our office, there are three of us, and we divide up the world and the world. Probably, could um, get cover my boss will cover uh, Europe, uh, USA. Uh, I cover ASEAN, Africa, and Dr. Bajra, my other colleagues of the Latin America. He did Japan also, and he is doing uh, the automotive industry, the healthcare industry, uh, the spa industry. So I look at the uh, agricultural industry and um, um, I do construction and uh, what else? Uh, agricultural related industry like uh, machine tools. But in the past two years, we have actually uh, promoted a lot of business to invest abroad because we think in the FTA, in the opening up, liberalization, the most important thing that we need to do is to, at this stage, is to go outside and invest. 
in Thailand, the Thai investor, we are very, very comfortable with our economy. We have plenty of food to eat, we don't have to fight. So going abroad is something that comes very last in our mind. But we need to go abroad. Or else we cannot be having our own investors investing in Thailand. And where should we be stand at that point of time? So that's what we are also doing. So those are broadly what we are doing now. Now what we are thinking of, uh, strategy, going ahead, um, there are five main issues that we need to address, not only um, um, by ourselves, by Thailand ourselves, but these are issues that we need, at least ASEAN, if not more, to address, to help address. The number one issue is the financial crisis. Now, of course, financial crisis is actually behind us very much in this region, but the financial uncertainty still looming around in Europe, and with the political uncertainty in the Middle East and the North uh, African countries, the chances that the recovery in the European country may not be all that high is there. So the question is, how do we address this financial uh, issue, financial security, financial crisis issues? We talk to many experts, and they all agree on one thing about financial crisis, that it will happen again. Can you prevent a financial crisis? No. Expert, the top expert in the world, cannot guarantee anybody that it will not happen again. Why? Because we still do not have an adequate financial mechanism in the world that are accommodating the current stage of economic development. An example is this, that Asia as a group is developing very, very quickly, particularly with China. Yeah, China will be growing at 7 8% in the next five, six years, according to your talk plan. Which means China economy by itself will grow at about 50% from today in five years' time, according to the plan. I am predict even higher than that. India will be growing also at about 7 8% per year. These two economies, these two big engine of growth for Asia, we will actually dominate the growth of all other economies in the world. And these two engines of growth will eventually have to link together as a pact in Asia. The goods of trade are quite similar. The industry that they're going into are quite similar. So somehow these two countries will have to join up somehow in the future. Asia will become a more integrated economy, economically, five years from now. And that is not a question of choice. There's no choice. It will have to be like that. But with the economy, which is about one third of the world GDP, no financial mechanism of any name to manage this economy. Depending on IMF and the international system, do you think that will work? It will not work, definitely. So Asia needs our own financial system. There's no question about it. The question is how to do it. But the need is definitely there. And there are many talks about that in ASEAN context. And um, I was party to a negotiation on the text of the report, the Chiang Initiative in 1999, which laid down some foundation for financial cooperation in ASEAN countries, plus three, plus Japan, Korea, and China. And now that there is 120 billion US dollars swap arrangement to procure for countries that has problem in the financial, uh, uh, run the financial crisis in the ASEAN plus three. This will grow. So I think this is something way beyond what Thailand can do. Thailand GDP is only 0.5% of GDP in the world, 
Okay. 0.5% vote. Right? Doesn't worry about anybody. ASEAN altogether at the moment is about 2% in the world. And we do well in 2015 with the AEC. We will probably have 2.6% GDP in the world. That's 10 countries. But with ASEAN plus three, we have a, a better chance to actually do something in the international arena in the G20, which is now the main forum for the financial uh, uh, exercise. So we also provide some input for the time and the government now on this issue. See, So economic liberalization, as I mentioned, is something that uh, cover uh, many, many aspects. Another issue that we think we need to address and very important for us is the issue of food security. Okay. I mentioned China with economy, India with economy. Now these people will grow in terms of numbers and also the wealth will be increasing. These two countries have one common problem and that is the water. The availability of water in the future is, is, uh, is a challenge for these two countries. And with the problem of water, the problem of agriculture will be there, which means also the food issue. Now, food security is normally uh, second in importance in most countries to national defense. Most government will not be able to sustain with a food crisis. In Thailand, we also have much experience of that. The government has to go if you cannot manage the food crisis in the country. China has an example of that. So this is a very important issue. The question is, how do we handle the food security issue? And particularly in Asia, because of the huge amount of population, one third of our population is around here, and they are going to eat more. Right? So where are you going to cater for all these people? And the other part of the world, the developed countries, the land area, they all, all use up. Population is also increasing. Food is not going to be an abundance for the world anymore. Now, unless we have a unified effort in this world, and we have a better agricultural policy, we will not be able to address the food crisis issue. I'm not trying to attack EU, but if the common agricultural policy in Europe still maintain big subsidies, you yourself will have to experience a huge problem. But that is aside because the problem in the Asia side is even larger because we have much more population to feed. And this is not something that can be done in the country. China and India cannot do this within the country. China and India need to buy food, and especially from ASEAN countries. Because we have food, we have water, resources to do that. But the question is, how do you arrange it so that there's some certainty for everybody? How can we make sure the Chinese can make, be sure that there will be supply of food when they need it from these ASEAN countries? How can they do that? This is a challenge, and there is actually there are some discussion on this issue. Every ASEAN plus three meeting, there is one paragraph. If you go and check, there is one paragraph on food security. Very important. Okay. And there are some mechanisms that uh, we are now playing a role. Of course, Thailand will have to play a very important role in this because we are now relatively more advanced in terms of food production and development than other countries in the region. So that's the second issue. The third issue is the energy crisis issue. And energy is a big challenge for us going forward in the future. Thailand imports energy, uh, uh, almost all the energy that we can choose by imported. And with the uncertainty increasing in the world from the supplier countries, 
I think we have to look for more alternative energy within the countries. And again, uh, aside from solar energy, wind energy, which are not very much here to harvest, we have to depend on biomass, which means agriculture. Again, so we have to use agriculture for energy. So food and energy issue will be competing in the region also. So why do you want to cater for the demand for food in China, India? You also have to manage the energy efficiency in the region and the security of energy in the region. We cannot build more nuclear plants. Certainly not a very popular idea now. So what's left aside from biomass? So that, I think, will be an alternative energy that we will spend quite a lot of effort on. Now the uh, issue followed directly from these two, energy and food, is the inflation issue. Now, prices are going up for food and for other products. Right? There's no way you can stop that, because this is not a phenomenon happening in Thailand or in China only, but it's happening at a global level. Right? What can you do? The pitfall that many countries fall into in the past is when the food price go up, what do you do? The government control the price of food. And what will happen after that? Food disappear from the market into a underground market. And the price is higher than what is the government control price. We have that example with the palm oil. But you, you, can, you can bet that will happen in our product also. If you read the news in Thailand, the government is trying to control the price of sugar. And I said, please, right, don't do that. In fact, increasing the price of food has two big advantages. Number one, it increases the income of the farmers, which is what we want from the beginning to balance, right? with the rich and the poor, we need to actually stimulate the farmers to grow more by not increasing the price. So why are you keeping the price low? If you're keeping the price low, you're taxing the farmers. And that's what we have been doing in the past. We are taxing our farmers heavily. And who do you support? The consumer in the city, us who are sitting around in this room also. But is it necessary for the government to do that? The answer actually is not. Because the increase in the price of food reflect the economic values of this food itself. Right? And the farmers will be able to grow more, put more attention to the crop that they grow if the price is higher. If the price of rice is, is, is now about uh, uh, 10,000 baht per ton. Okay. If it's 100,000 baht per ton, right? You will treat your rice every stop like your own little baby, right? taking care of it nice and dead to make sure that it grows well. But if the price is low, you say, well, you know, I'll go and have something to eat first before I come and take care of you. So we need to increase the price of agricultural produce in order to maintain the balance also, and also to give more uh, income to the poor. So that's what we are suggesting to the government, but um, we do not write this in the newspaper because we do that. If we do that, the government will probably be kicked out, and I'll be the first one to kick out from the government <laughs> to suggest that. But I think the trend is that. And what we do is we then try to increase the income all the people who got affected by the increase in the price of food, which is the poor in the city, to so increase minimum wage and so forth. But you balance out, so taking care of this effect. So the middle income class will have to absorb some of this and, you know, as we go along. So that's the inflation issue. The last issue is a social disparity issue. So income disparity I mentioned with liberalization. And it's something that uh, uh, happened at all levels, as I said, global level, country level, and also at the provincial level. And we need to actually address the issue by strengthening the population uh, at the base. And in order to do this, 
not only the government. You can't depend on the government. You look at the structure of the government, any government, the structure of any government. Five years ago and now, they're more or less the same. Ten years ago and now, some changes. But the problem that we are encountering is changing almost every minute. There's no way the government sector, which is very big, the bureaucracy, can move as fast as the issue that arises. But who can? The private sector can. Because that is your survival. So you have to move. You change, you adjust, you modify, you have new business model, you do business differently, you change your trade group, and so forth. But the government doesn't have that kind of flexibility. And because of the rigidity of the government bureaucracy, the rigidity of the government bureaucracy, the private sector have to play this very, very important role of managing some of these problems. In the past, when there's a problem, okay, the problem is the government. I take the profit. Right? That's how the business sector is there to do. You have a problem, go to the government office and say, hey, I have a problem. But what about the win that you have, the profit that you make? Well, that's my profit, right? It's not your profit, <laughs> it's my profit. I pay taxes. <laughs> but it's more than taxes that you need to pay in order to make a society more balanced. Because if the society is not balanced, the long-term existence of the society will not be there either. So actually, this world is full of this kind of problem, this parity problem. It depends on how it expresses itself and when it, the issue is right to erupt. We are actually sitting on a big time bomb. Right? I look at the number uh, and the study about uh, democracy and Right now, I think about 70% of the population, no, sorry, about 60% of the population in the world are living in a democratic government. About 40% are living in a non-democratic government. And the trend is um, uh, the people in the non-democratic government is decreasing over time. So it is a matter of time that this change that is happening in North Africa and the Middle East will take place. And if you look at all these cases, uh, Middle East and, and, and uh, North Africa, it all comes from this income disparity problem. But more than that, more than that, aside from income disparity, what is more important and that the Thai case has shown is the inequality in the society. Inequality in society comes together with income inequality, but it probably disguised in another fashion. A son of a police officer can drive to a red light, but you can't. So he's more privileged than you are, isn't it? So they say that's not fair, you know, you can't drive to a red light. That kind of disparity. A guy can uh, has priority in many things, and others do not have that. Right? And you feel that you are a bit oppressed by the system, by another are not. So that kind of inequality is good back, and it may have some income component in that, but that feelings, even though you have more income, you are not that happy. And that accumulates over time, and you will up at some point. And I think these are something that the world over, we have to address them. In Thailand, we foresee that, and we have seen this problem, and we try to address it. And we're going through this motion at the moment of political adjustment in order to take care of some of this problem. So um, trade representative is not only trade these days. Um, all the issues are, in fact, intertwined both economics, social, and political, the intertwined. I don't think you can have a clear demarcation that this is economic issues, you solve economic issues, and that's your task. 
finish. And this is the political issue, the police can go and solve it. And it's not like that anymore. Issues are all over the place. I mentioned to you, as we work on this issue, um, we find these are the dimension of things that we need to do. So then we look back at what is Thai trade representative does. In fact, in our mandate, our key mandate is to coordinate among agencies. And that's why we need to look at the issue in a more comprehensive manner. Because without an office like this, in other countries also, it is difficult for you to execute a coherent policy in a country. Because the main issue all cut across. My five main issue I just mentioned to you, they cut across all ministries. They cut across all territories. So because of that, um, this government tried to establish the Thai Press Representative Office not to manage this issue. Have we been successful? Mm, to a certain extent, I think we have based on well. But uh, we have a lot of problems with the line agency. We have two problems. And I think, uh, I think Australia has gone through that, and many countries have gone through that. In Australia, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they call it Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, because you merge the two in, uh, ministries together to make one. Because there are problems of who is responsible for this issue, trade or foreign affairs. They are getting so close, so intertwined. So many countries have adjusted already, but Thailand has not. We have Ministry of Commerce, we have Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we have Ministry of Industry, we have Ministry of Energy, we have Ministry of Labor. Liberalization issue touched upon all these. And also human development issues, social security issues. We have borders issues also, which is, uh, you know, national security issues. They are part and parcel of what is called liberalization, economic liberalization. So this is why the, the Thai government established this office and we have done our work, uh, uh, some accomplishment in a certain aspect, but uh, I think we still have quite a lot to do uh, in the future. And uh, this is what I would like to share with you. I hope you uh, learned something from it. And uh, with that note, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I must tell you that I talked to Dr. Tap, you know, uh, about the topics for this afternoon, uh, talking about economic liberalization. And he said, who would be interested in economic liberalization? The topic, it doesn't seem so interesting, you know. Nothing in comparison to nuclear earthquake, you know, in, in Japan or anything like that. But I tell him that this is a very important subject. And after listening to him, uh, this matter is uh, really uh, very exciting, very uh, interesting. It, it is really uh, cover all areas, you know, of, of our in a way, livelihood, you know, uh, in economic liberalization. And uh, today, uh, in fact, we have been listening to the summing up, in a way, of uh, he ha what he has been doing for the past two years at Thai Trade Representative. And I think your observation, your analysis is very, very invaluable for, for us. I, I mean, you think you know the job at night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I put down a lot of points. <laughs> and some question that I may have to ask that right, right. Uh, to, 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 to ask him. But I, I, I believe you, you, you have a lot of uh, questions to, to ask him yourself. So now uh, the floor is open. And we will the first one. Professor Waiko, could you? Uh, thank you for uh, the best of the I just want to tell you what you have seen. Uh, both these Institute of Diplomacy and International Studies, and in Assumption University, there is a great interest for the topic of economic liberalization. So here, uh, under the subject multilateral diplomacy, in Assumption University, under topic negotiations, 
we very often refer to uh, pre-trade agreements, uh, and I'm very pleased that uh, you made an excellent uh, review of trade agreements. By the way, uh, we give, as a good example, the trade agreement between uh, Australia and Thailand, Australia, Thailand, and New Zealand. But we have big questions about negotiations concerning the conclusion of a free trade agreement between the United States and Thailand. Now, I'm not going to ask you about that. I am going to ask you something uh, much simpler that uh, I think very, very important, which was not mentioned by you. How do you see the role of the group of 77 in the global economic liberalization, having in mind that we must be now bilateralist, bilateralist, and multilateralist? In this multilateralism, Sometimes we think about all trade system as something very, very distant. How could we have a universal trade system, equitable, non-discriminatory, and rules-based? So I think that the group of 77 has this ideology at this point. But the group of 77 is not visible. So young people in Thailand, they don't know that Thailand is a founding father of the group of 77. They don't know that very recently Thailand had the challenge of the group of 77 in Nigeria. So how do you see the role of the group of 77, which is in fact a group of 130 times plus China, in the global economic liberalization? if there is such a role. Thank you.